As you're giving today, I want to invite you to turn with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And in just a moment, um, we are going to um, end the year as a church. We're going to pray together. But before we get there, I want to give you the message um, that the Lord has laid on my heart today to close out the year with. And we've been in a series. I hope you have enjoyed it. In fact, um, I know that you have, and, and you've, you've enjoyed it more, and you've, you've been changed and transformed more than I thought that was even going to happen when we started this parabolic teaching um, through what we called Christmas at the movies. And we've been looking at Christmas movies the last few weeks. I don't know, did anybody yesterday watch A Christmas Story? Right, yeah. And so I'm the guy, if you didn't know, I'm the guy, my wife hates it. I'm the guy that I put it on as soon as we get up, which was for us yesterday at 5.30 yesterday morning, and it's gonna stay on until 8 p.m. And it's not, and nobody's allowed to touch the remote. Um, that's how I roll, that's how I do. Um, I love a Christmas story. Um, and so uh, as we end the series and it's actually the day after Christmas, and so I hope you're still in a festive mood. I hope you are still in a holiday spirit because that's actually one of the primary uh, themes of this movie, of this uh, story that we're going to look at today, this parable, if you will, as we look at the principles of Scripture out of a movie that we all know as Elf. Come on, somebody. We have Buddy the Elf here for all of your great picture needs. Um, if you want to take a family photo, Elf has grown a beard. Um, and he has gotten tatted up a little bit, just so you know. Um, and so his sleeves um, are not quite long enough, uh, but um, we have Buddy the Elf here for your pictures today for you and your family. How many of you guys love the movie Elf? Uh, I love the movie Elf. It is one of the things that brings more laughter to me. There are lines from this movie um, that just kill me. I think it's, uh, in fact, if you haven't seen it on Netflix, there is actually um, a story of the making of Elf. And there are just some really cool facts about how it was made and some of the scenes um, and everything. And it's just a fun movie. It's one I love to watch with the kids. But the story, if you haven't ever watched the movie, um, in fact, Monica, had never watched Elf, and so yesterday, last night, after A Christmas Story ended at 8 p.m., uh, we put on Elf uh, and let Monica watch Elf so that in the message today, she wouldn't be completely lost, and she would have a little bit of understanding of what it's about. So if you don't know what it's about, it's about a, uh, an Elf named Buddy, but the thing is, is Elf, I mean, Buddy isn't really an Elf. Buddy is a human. Buddy was an orphan, and he crawled into Santa's bag, and Santa had him as a stowaway, and he took him back to the North Pole, and knowing that he was an orphan, uh, Papa Elf in the North Pole actually adopted Buddy the Elf and raised him as an elf in the North Pole. Uh, now, this, uh, this story and this uh, message today, I guess if you were to write down a question in your notes, um, I would just tell you to write down, who am I? Who am I? Because it's, that's kind of what the movie is about. It's about a guy who's from two worlds. And those two worlds conflict with one another. And he's trying to carry one world into another world, and then he gets in another world, and that world isn't receptive to what one world says, and so he tries to adapt a little bit to that world. And it's just a big question of who am I? And it's a, uh, it's a perfect illustration of who we are as believers in Christ. It's, it's a perfect illustration of that battle that we all face of, uh, of who am I? How do I take both worlds and manage the two? How do I figure out how to operate in one world when there's so much, of, there's so much inside of me that seems to come from another world? And, and how, do I, how do I manage this tension in my life? And so that's what we're going to look at today. In fact, the Bible tells us in John chapter 17, and that's where I told you to turn. In verse 14, it says that I've given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world, this is Jesus speaking, any more than I am of the world. Look at your neighbor and say, you are not of this world. We are in this world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. Now, when I was in college, I read a book. I read a book in college. It was called Heaven is a Place on Earth. 
It's one of the most revelation, it was one of the most uh, revelatory books that I'd ever re- read in college. Um, and I still have a copy of it in my office. And basically the premise of the book is this, that everybody who says um, that, that, um, that I'm not, uh, that this world has no place for me um, is absolutely wrong because people say I'm not created for this world. Actually, you were created for this world. You were just not created of this world. Are you with me? We were all created for this world in Genesis 1. And you know what the Bible says? This is where we will be. New Jerusalem, new heaven, new earth, this world. But we are not of this world because we were created with the breath of another world. So while we are for a world, we are not of a world. Are you with me? And that's what Jesus is wanting us to know here. That's where the tension comes in place. Because I am for this world, but I am not of this world. And it goes on to say that in verse 15, he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of this world. Isn't that interesting that Jesus says, my prayer is not to take you out of the world. In fact, I talked about my my disdain for this... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for the song uh, I'll Fly Away last week. I, t- I apologize if that offended anyone, but, but I'm, I'm somebody who, I, I don't have a desire to leave this world. Why? Because Jesus said it's not his desire for me to leave this world. It's my desire that I stay until my assignment is finished. I'm not, I, listen, God help me the day. And, and, and there may be people who have said this at one time or another, and I'm, I'm not trying to bring condemnation, but I hope there is never a day where I wake up every day just holding on for glory. I hope that never happens. I hope there is never a day where I wake up and all I want is to leave this world and go to the next. I hope I will always live with the mentality that Jesus said, it is not my desire to take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. First Peter chapter one, verse 13 says, therefore with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as one who called you is holy, listen what it says, so be holy in all that you do. Now, I'm not going to call the person out, but, but maybe the language I use here is going to frustrate somebody because there is someone in the room that when we talk about stuff like this, um, they, they always throw out balance, balance, balance. I'm going to try not to even give eye contact with that person right now so that you don't know who it is. Um, balance. And they say everything needs to be balanced. But the Bible tells us that balance actually comes in my life. I'm not against balance. I'm not saying there shouldn't be a balance between the world and my faith in God. But the truth of the matter is, is there's only going to be balance in my life when everything that I do is holy. What does the word holy mean? It means set apart. Not apart. Listen, listen, there are, and that's why, that's why it's, it's, it's tough for me sometimes because we have people um, who are Sunday Christians. Come on, somebody. Amen. Um, that you act like Jesus when you're here, but you act like the devil Monday through Saturday. Um, and let me tell you why that doesn't work. Because he didn't come to make you holy one day a week. He came to make you holy every day. And he didn't come to set you apart one day a week to make you look like Jesus one day a week, to operate like Jesus one day a week. The truth of the matter is, is he came to make us holy every day of the week and to set us apart every day of the week and to make us look like Jesus every part of the week. And that's going to operate different at different seasons and different times of my life. But I know that it says that I am to be holy because I am like him called to be holy for it is written be holy because I am holy and that is God's way of saying that a holy God is the is the one that you say is the the king of kings and the lord of lords of your life and if that were true then I would be holy as he is holy and that's what we have to strive to be and so there's this tension okay of how do I operate in the earth how do I operate in the world how do those two things mesh together um, and so let's um, as we as we're introduced to buddy we're going to start with one clip um, I have three clips for you today um, and and the first clip um, gives you a little bit of insight as to one thing that I want you to understand that buddy had to go through um, buddy um, is uh, supposed to be a toy maker uh, and buddy is not a very good toy maker because he's not an elf he's a human now in the scene that you are about to see buddy does not yet know that he's a human 
And so in this scene, I want you to watch at some of the language that is used here, and then we're going to use this as a parable to show you some of the teaching of Scripture. So check out clip number one. Anybody in the room ever feel like a cotton-headed ninny muggins? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you relate to that? Yeah. Listen, I don't know if there's anybody else here, seriously, that um, I'm your pastor and I experience this a lot, so I know that, that you have to experience this as well. And there are a lot of times I feel like that I'm, I'm talking to God and I'm, he's like, how many etch sketches did you get done today? And I'm like, I did 85? And he's like, hmm, that's only 970 off the pace. I feel like there's a lot of times where I'm not as productive as I need to be. I feel like I'm not as gifted as other people. I feel like I'm not serving as well. Um, I don't know if you struggle with this, man, but, but I struggle with this, and I do. I, I just say to myself over and over and over, I say, John, you're just, you're just a cotton-headed ninny muggins, man. You, are, uh, you don't fit. You don't belong. You are wasting your time. You're an embarrassment. But, but the first thing that I wrote down that the Bible teaches us, and this is perfect parabolic teaching for it. Everything about this movie is just perfect parables um, to what the Bible teaches us. The first thing that I wrote down is you have to find your fit. You have to find your fit. And you've got to be okay with where you fit. And you've got to know that God designed you. You know, the one thing that I know about who am I is my identity is the truest thing about me. And what do I mean by that? Listen, your identity, if you didn't know this, your identity is the truest thing about you. What that means is, is what you know yourself as will be who you are. 
It, it, it is not what you want to do. It is not what you're trying to do. The most powerful thing in your life is how you perceive yourself. I mean, that's why I love the line that we just sang in that song a moment ago that says, you crown me with confidence. Because if I perceive it, you know, it's, it's amazing. I heard these two psychological terms years ago in college that there were these two things. And I don't know if this is something they even still teach, if this is even relevant anymore. But I remember when I was in college and I had to take psychology that they taught us that there were two factors um, that create identity. One is called the early factor and the other is called the often factor. And I don't know if this is still taught, but I still remember this from college. The early factor are the things that are spoken over you as children. Those actually shape your identity. In fact, I, I was, uh, there's this pastor I know, and, um, and his daughter, who was like five or six years old one time, uh, she went in and she wanted to stand on a scale, and she was standing on a scale, and he was freaking out because he thought like his five or six-year-old little girl was starting to have like a little bit of second guessing about her weight, and he was like, she is too young to be worried about how much she weighs, and so she would get on the scale, and she would get off, and she would get on the scale, and she would get off, and my friend looked at his daughter, and he said, uh, he said baby, what, what does it say? It says, she said, it says I'm beautiful. <laughs> and I was like, that is exactly what we need to, to be speaking over each other, over our children. Because what we, what we hear in our ears from people around us, it can shape. That's what we see here with, with Buddy. You know, I love that little girl just saying, I can't read the numbers, but I know what I am. I'm beautiful because you've told me that I'm beautiful. That's one of the things I try to do. Uh, I'm, I'm much better at it with my daughters than I am my wife. So, baby, you are beautiful. Let me just say that. Um, but, but I try not to ever let a day go by where I don't look at my two little girls and tell them that they're beautiful. But then there's also this thing called the often factor. And the often factor are actually the words that are spoken over us as adults. And they actually create identity as well. It's not just when we're children. And that identity will begin to carry over in the way that we walk our life of faith. And we have to make sure that we are not letting our identity be taken over by the wrong voices and the wrong world. That, that we've got to make sure that our identity is found. In fact, I, I don't really have time to read this, um, but, but I wanted to do a lot of this. I didn't even put it in my notes, so don't think I'm skipping anything. But I wanted to just look at the first three chapters uh, of uh, the, the book of Ephesians. If you've never read the first three chapters, they're all about identity. And, and even in the first chapter alone, I think the word in Christ is written in the first, uh, maybe it's either the first chapter or the first three chapter in Christ is written 14 times. And every time it talks about our identity and how my identity is found in Christ. And I've got to know that my identity is found in Christ. I'm not a cottonhead in any muggins. I just have to find my fit in the kingdom of God. I've got to know who I am in Christ. I've got to know how God designed me so that I can be effective and I can operate the way God has called me to operate. Isaiah chapter 64 verse 8 says, yet you Lord are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. That's all I need to know about who I I am. I'm not the work of anybody else's hand. I'm the work of my father in heaven. In fact, this movie is about a guy named Buddy who ends up spending his time pursuing his father so he can understand more of who he is. And if you want to know who you are, you don't find out who you are by pursuing yourself. You find out who you are by pursuing your father. That's how you, that's how you, that's how you learn who you are. I am, I am the workmanship of the hands of God. I am uniquely made, the Bible says in Psalm 139. Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 says what? It says, before I was formed, God knew me. Before I was born, God set me apart. It says, He appointed, I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. So all of my life is uniquely made in Christ. And if I'm going to find out who that is, I've got to get to him. And the reality is, listen to me, guys, the reality is this. All of you have a fit. All of you have a place in the kingdom. All of you are gifted in the kingdom. But some of those things in your life, listen to me, they are not tapped into yet. You have to tap into them. I think it was uh, uh, about a year ago I preached a message and I sang the Beverly Hillbilly song right there for you to understand that, yeah, down inside of you there's some oil and you might have to find it. 
You might have to locate that thing. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8, it says we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If your gift is serving, then serve. If your gift is teaching, then teach. If your gift is to encourage, then give encouragement. Some of you don't see that as a gift. You see what I do as a gift because I get up and I teach and I speak, but you don't know that you can be an encouragement and that that is a gift from God and you need to use that gift. That could be your fit. He says if it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then lead diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. But all of you have a fit. You have to locate your father so you can find your fit so that you can operate in the gifting that corresponds with your design. Amen? Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you are gifted. You have a fit. You have a place. Listen, there are a lot of churches you can go. I I know this from experience. There are a lot of churches that you could go that could care less about the gifting in your life. You are not at that church. You have a pastor that this is my wheelhouse. This is what I live and breathe. And I'm not talking about how you can serve Faith Community Church. We want you to serve here. That's not what I'm talking about. This is why I talk about this subject so much because I know that Monday through Saturday, you are sent out into a mission field and you have a fit for the kingdom of God and you need to be in full operation of what God has in your life. I want you to be in operation here, but I want you to hear me beyond that. You need to be in full operation every single day of your life of the fit that God has for you. That's one of the things that I love about Buddy we're going to see in just a moment. He's in full operation in who he is every second of the rest of the movie. He doesn't have to be in the North Pole. He doesn't have to be with Santa. He doesn't have to be with the other elves. It doesn't matter who he's with. He's in full operation. You need to be in full operation. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. If you know me well at all, you know that I read this passage often and a lot. You are given the opportunity to steward the grace of God. You need to steward that well. You, need, you could be the hindrance of somebody else receiving the grace of God in their life. It is, the ball is in my court. I told the young people on Wednesday as I was sharing a story of one of the great moments of of student ministry uh, that that I was able to be a part of and how our entire student ministry was changed from one little girl who, I'm not even going to go into her story, but has one of the most horrible, awful stories that you will ever hear. I had no idea. She came down. Her life was transformed. Her entire um, demeanor changed at school, at home. Her whole family got saved. Her mom was a drug addict that uh, was a meth addict. Her mom came, got saved. Her uncles, her aunts, her grandma, her sister, all got, everybody in her family got saved. She, her, our student ministry exploded because she tapped into who she was in Christ. And that was it. And it wasn't, she didn't do anything spectacularly well at the time. She wasn't a speaker. She wasn't a singer. She just tapped into who her father was. And it changed everything about who we were as a ministry. And you know what I told the students on Wednesday night? You are plan A and there is no plan B. You are plan A. God wants to use the church. He wants to use his sons and daughters to be the carriers of the kingdom of God. And that is up to me and it is up to you to make sure that we are being good stewards of the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Then the story goes on. Story goes on with Buddy. He decides after he finds out that he's a human that he's going to go to New York. And he's going to find his father. And when he gets to New York, we start to learn something about Buddy as he tries to operate. Now, this is where that struggle between heaven and earth becomes a struggle. And so I want you to watch this second clip real quick and watch how Buddy operates when he gets to New York.
My second point may be my favorite thing to tell you because I say it all the time and I mean it. There's two ways I'll give you point number two. The first way that I'll say it is this. Be weird. Or, or, if you want to write it down differently, be like Eddie. Because that's what he says about himself all the time. That, that's what he tells you. If, you. if you ever talk to Eddie, and I, and I say this all the time, Eddie will say, now, I know I'm weird. And, and there just comes a point you think he would quit prefacing that. We all know that. But he just continues to say, you know, I'm weird. You know, it's okay for God's people to be weird. In fact, the Bible actually tells us we should be a little weird. There should be a little bit of that other world that carries over into this world where we don't quite fit into what is normal, right? You know, there, there's a lot of things when it comes to weird people that I had written down. I'd written all these funny things about weird church people. Probably one of my favorite things, I had this pastor that... that um, he got saved, and um, he was just transformed and changed overnight, and he wanted to get married. He wanted to meet um, a girl, and uh, when he met uh, the right girl that he thought that she was the right one for him to start dating after he got saved, he was a big Top Gun fan, and I don't know if you remember, but there was a famous line in Top Gun um, where he says, uh, take me home or lose me for, or take me to bed or lose me forever. You remember that? Now, he's saved, so he didn't say it that way, but he did look at this girl that he didn't even know. He looked at her, he said, take me to church or lose me forever, and I just thought that was the weirdest line I've ever heard anybody say. Um, but, but you know, as, as God's people, we are going to be set apart. This is the way that I've always said it. As we think about what is normal, is that really what any of us want? You know, a few of the things that I always bring up when we talk about what's normal. Um, here's a few things that are normal. Divorce is normal. Addiction is normal. Being broke and in debt is normal. We could go on and on and on with what is normal. Now, here's what I know, and I don't know if you would agree with me, but this is what I would tell you. Normal doesn't work. Normal doesn't work. So there is this concept in Christianity called sanctification. It is this setting apart where I realize there, there comes a moment in every person's life that tries to be a follower of Jesus. Listen, there is a moment. There is what we would call an epiphany. That is literally what the word epiphany means. It means a piece of wisdom or knowledge or understanding that comes from a divine place. We have an epiphany at some point that, yes, I am in the world, but I am not of the world. And that I have to operate not according to where I am, but according to where I am from. I'm going to say that again. I will operate not according to where I am, but according to what I am of. And when you begin, listen, let me tell you something. I'll be the, because I, you got to remember, I tell you this all the time. I grew up in this church. We were the freaks. We were, we were the ones that everybody was laughing at, picking on. We were the ones that were the crazy people. Listen, I know what it's like to grow up in, a, in an environment that, that people who were normal would look down on, would try to judge, would try to question. But here's what I will tell you. That everything that you know about your pastor that is planted in me is because of those weird people like Linda Airwood. She planted that in my life. Myrtle Belangia, she planted that in my life. Donald Brady, he planted that in my life. Evelyn, Tommy, Byron, Trina, Ricky Jr., I mean, uh, listen, Tina, all of you guys, you, you guys are feel, I mean, I could go back to years and years ago and remembering things that took place in this church that no one would have thought was normal, but I stand here today shaped and molded who, of who I am today, knowing that it's because I was around a group of people, and I'm grateful for it. I was around a group of people that didn't operate according to where they were from. I mean, they, they didn't operate according to where they were. They operated according to where they were from. And we as God's people have got to be set apart. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If my mind was okay the way that it was before Christ, then it would never need to be renewed. 
This is a principle. This is something in scripture that is mentioned multiple times. This idea of a, of a mindset change, a renewal of the mind. Why do I need a renewal of the mind? Because my mind is set on where I am and not what I'm of. And God has to have this moment in my mind where that is transformed and changed. Then it says, then, look at your neighbor and say, then. Then then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. See, this is my problem with people. People want to know God's will for their life. They ask me this all the time. I get this question all the time. But here's the problem, Scott. All the people that ask me what God's will is, they aren't afraid to be weird. If you're not ready to be weird, then you're not, ready, you're not ready for the will. If you're not ready for a renewing of your mind to operate on something that is from another place, another world, at Buddy the Elf, everything from this point on in the movie, he is in New York, but he is operating as if he is in the North Pole, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to live my life that way with heaven. That is a parable, if ever a parable. Listen, he goes in to people, and he, she says, why, he says, why are you smiling? I love smiling. Smile is my favorite, yeah. right? I mean, just thing after thing, it's like you watch this guy operate from, 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 from one place to the next, and while he is in New York, because that's what he was created for, it was not what was inside of him. And he let what was inside of him take control of where he was. And it ends up changing everything about every person that he comes into contact with in the movie. This girl that he meets, this manager of a store, his own father, his little brother. I could go, well, everybody's life was changed. And it wasn't changed because he became like them. They were changed because he operated based on what was inside of him. I wrote these two things down. Weird people don't think like normal people think, and weird people don't live like normal people live. That's, that's just the fact. I, I, I know that there are people who look at the way that I think, and sometimes you go, dude, you are weird. I know, and I love it. And I'm not right all the time. And I'm not accurate all the time. I don't have it all figured out. But I do know, I, this is all I can tell you as your pastor. There is something that is bubbling on the inside of me called the kingdom of God. And that kingdom, that kingdom is unlike anything that I've ever come into contact with. And that kingdom can't stay inside of me. I, I wish, I, I'm like Jeremiah, man. I wish I could shut my mouth. I wish I could not speak of it. But like Jeremiah, what did Jeremiah say? But it is burning like a fire on the inside of me. I wish that I, I wish that I could be a normal pastor sometimes like some of you are looking for. But that's not who I am because I have the kingdom of God on the inside of my life. And I want everything that happens inside of me to flow from the kingdom of God and not flow from what is just normal. I don't want to think like that. I don't want to live like that. I want when people see me, I don't want them to see just another pastor. I want them to see the kingdom of heaven. That's what I want them to see because that is what is going to draw them. That is what is going to change them. That is what is going to transform them. So it is okay for you to be weird. Amen. Amen. Last thing. At the end of the movie, after everything that goes on, Santa comes to New York. It's Christmas Eve slash Christmas night. Now, if you don't know, there's a thing on Santa's slate that they build. It's called the clausometer. And it shows how much belief there is. And because the belief has gotten so low, they actually put an engine on the sleigh that is supposed to be supernatural. If I ain't preaching to the modern day church, I don't know what I'm doing. You will never be able to replace the supernatural power of God with an engine, okay? And the engine malfunctions, if you remember, the engine malfunctions and Santa crashes down in Central Park. And while Santa's crashed down, he sees Buddy the Elf, and he says, Buddy, will you come, will you come help me fix the sleigh? And Buddy says, well, well yeah, I, I will. And, and, and Buddy thinks in his mind that he's going to fix the engine. But what Buddy doesn't know is that Bo Buddy has already been working on fixing the sleigh. 
And he was getting back to the supernatural sleigh. Because all through the movie, he talked about believing in Santa. He talked about the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. And while the sleigh is crashed down, and Buddy thinks to himself, I, I got to fix this, this engine. I want you to watch and see what Buddy actually does. Because what he actually does is he gives the supernatural power back to Santa. And this is a parable of who I believe that we are as a ministry. We are a ministry. I, I know this. I'm not stupid. I know that we're a ministry that we don't work on a lot of engines, but we will work on faith and we will work on belief. Watch this last clip as we see singing, again, the breast of spirit, Christmas cheer, singing loud for all to hear. Watch what it does to Santa Slay. What would the church be like if we would let this contagious nature of the kingdom of God begin to spread? The kingdom is contagious. It is. It's contagious. The, the point number three that I wrote down was collective faith has supernatural power. It says that, I mean, in the movie, I don't know if you remember, in, in the movie, they're singing and the dad is pretending to sing, but he's not really singing. And the little boy looks up, his little son looks up to him and says, dad, you're not really singing. He says, yes, I am. I'm singing. He says, no, you're not. And when that guy begins to sing, all of a sudden that clausimeter goes from about 75% to 100% and then no longer is an engine needed to keep it going. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, it says, again, truly, I tell you that if any 
two of you on earth agree about any one thing they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. That's the type of contagious nature that we want to spread here. Because there's another story, I'm not going to read it to you, but there's another story in Mark chapter 5. It's in your notes. If you have the Bible app, you can go back and read this entire story. But it's the story of Jairus' daughter. Um, and, and in this story, this is the story where you find the story with the woman with the issue of blood as well. She's in the middle of Jairus' story. Jairus comes and says, my daughter is sick. I need you to come heal my daughter. And Jesus says, okay, I will come. And then the Bible says Jesus went with him. And I was telling them earlier how much that one line meant to me earlier when I was reading that story where it says Jesus went with him and how amazing it is that when I need him, Jesus goes with me. Come on, somebody. Isn't that awesome to think about? It says, and Jesus went with him. And then when he got to Jairus' house, uh, the daughter was actually already dead. And he goes into Jairus' house, and they're going to perform the miracle of raising his daughter back up. But the Bible says something happens when he gets there, that there are people in the room that don't believe. And the Bible says that Jesus actually has to clear the room out. And I always write down the question next to, at, to that. Listen, guys, I don't know if you've ever questioned this about your life, but do you belong in the room? I don't want to be outside of the room. Listen, a miracle is a miracle. Like, a miracle is a miracle. I get it. Like, it would have been, it would have been pretty cool to stand outside the door and to watch and to sit outside the window. But I don't want to be on the outside, guys. I want to be in the room with it. I want to be in the room with it. And I'm telling you something, that if we will come together in faith, the same way that we see right here in this, this, this parable uh, of, of Buddy the Elf spreading Christmas cheer and, and, and spending the entire movie letting what is inside of him, of what he is of, not where he from but what he is of he begins to let that flow out of his life and how that begins to spread from one person to another person to another person to another person and the more that it begins to spread the more supernatural power begins to flow back into the sleigh I don't know if you know this but the church of Jesus Christ is the sleigh that's the sleigh that's how God wants to deliver every promise that's how he wants to deliver every blessing that's how he wants to deliver every miracle that's how he wants to deliver every salvation we are the sleigh and if all we have are engines we are going to be limited to what we can deliver but if we can get back to spreading what we are of and not where we are from then that supernatural manifestation of what God can do will flow back into the church and we will then be able to deliver what God has called us to deliver amen amen this is a movie about the kingdom and about how God has called us to operate in the kingdom. It's inside of us all. You get one taste of it. You will not go back. You get a taste of it. You will never think the same again. You're going to still have days that are tough, but you won't think the same way. What once was a what, what once you carried at one time you carried a victim mentality. Now you know what you know what I, there were there was a day that I carried a victim mentality in my life and I was like, well, this is because I'm this or this is because I'm that. I, you know, if people didn't come to the altars, I would say it's because I ain't a good preacher. And if people didn't get saved, it's because I didn't have the right word. Or if people didn't get healed, it was because I didn't pray the right prayer. And, and, and that used to be the way that I thought. You know the way that I think about it now. Now I get frustrated at the enemy because I go, no, this ain't the way it's supposed to be. It's a completely different mindset. It's a completely different mindset. No longer is it based on who I am, but it's based on what I'm of. And now I'm thinking about, I'm like, wait a minute now, this ain't the way it ought to be. People ought to be running to the altar. People ought to be giving their lives to Jesus. People ought to be uh, getting touched from heaven in their life. Man, I, I do. I just go, wait a minute, this, this shouldn't be. And it's not wrapped around my identity anymore. It's wrapped about what is on the inside of me. It's wrapped about it up in the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you that, that you are of another world and God wants to take that and flow it into this world that's what he wants to do and it will be contagious